ready to go. All right, it looks like it is. First of all, hello everybody. I want to thank you for coming to our first educational webinar for the Mid-Atlantic Territory. I'm really excited about today's topic. I wanted to just go over a couple things with you. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a thing that says Q&A. Please go ahead and put any questions that you may have um, for Dr. Marigakis in that. At the end of the presentation, we will go through the list of questions and be able to answer them at that time. So it's right at the bottom of your screen or it should be right at the bottom of your screen. So thank you very much for that. I also wanted to let you know that this is being recorded. It will be placed on our YouTube video channel, and but it will be probably a couple weeks before it gets to, to that. So I just wanted to let everybody know. I think that's about it. Like I say, I'm very excited about today's topic. Our topic is the evolving landscape of therapeutic targets in ALS clinical trials 2022. And our speaker is Dr. Nicholas Marigakis. Dr. Marigakis is the medical director at John Hopkins ALS Clinical Trials Unit. He's also the director of the ALS Center for Cell Therapy and Regeneration Research. He's a professor of neurology at John Hopkins University, and he is the leads the center, the John Hopkins Center for ALS Specialty Care. So I'm going to turn the screen over to you, Dr. Marigakis, and I want to thank you very much for taking this time out of your busy schedule to share this with us. Well, thank you. It's a privilege to be here, and um, I look forward to sharing what I view as um, really an evolving landscape with, um, with the participants. So I'm just gonna jump right into things um, here. So these are my uh, disclosures for consultation, research support, and clinical trial research support. And these are some of the objectives today. Um, talk a little bit about epidemiology of ALS. Where does it start? Some of the pathophysiology, that is what causes the disease. We're just gonna to touch on those briefly, but we're gonna talk about how clinical signs and symptoms occur, a little bit about diagnosis, but the bulk of today's talk, I wanna really focus on um, new uh, therapeutics and how we're thinking about new therapeutics and clinical trials. So ALS is a common uh, motor neuron disease and the annual incidence is about three per 100,000 with a lifetime risk of one in 300 individuals. And in fact, while the mean age of onset is about 55 or 56 years of age, we certainly see, and in my clinic, patients from their 20s all the way up through their 80s. So it really is a disease that, that spans a, a large age range. We talk about survival being from typically from two to five years from symptom onset and maybe one to two years from diagnosis. I think these numbers might be changing a little bit. An important percentage, maybe 10% of patients can live for 10 years or more. This is an important subset of patients for us to try to understand what makes them unique. The ALS prevalence is probably increasing over time and that could be partly because of an aging patient population or an aging population in general that may contribute to this increased prevalence of the disease. So I put this here to remind myself and remind you that ALS is characterized by the degeneration of these upper motor neurons, those that uh, start from the brain and are outlined here in red, as well as degeneration of lower motor neurons that go to the muscle. And it's this combination of degeneration in these upper and lower motor neurons that defines the disease. And you can see here that the upper motor neurons go from the brain to the spinal cord, and they talk with a second group of nerves, the lower motor neurons, that go from the spinal cord out to the muscle. And some patients have a predominance of involvement in those upper motor neurons that leads to stiffness and spasticity, where others have problems with lower motor neurons that leads to muscle weakness and muscle loss. I put this here because this isn't gonna be a, uh, an extensive talk about the causes of ALS so much, but 
I want you to be aware of a, a particular protein called TDP43. It's a protein that hides out in the nucleus of the cell, but for reasons we're trying to understand in ALS, it ends up in the wrong place. And you can see here in the, with these red arrows that instead of this protein here in brown being in the nucleus, it ends up in the cytoplasm. And so it's in the wrong place in neurons of patients with ALS. And this is a very common phenomenon. It's seen in about 90% of all our ALS patients. And why is that? Well, that's a, an enormous focus of research. It's really this discovery that was made a little over 10 years ago, but has spawned a lot of potential new therapeutics and new ways that we think about the disease. So we think about ALS and one of the key linchpins being this particular protein called TDP43. You know, thematically, the other thing I want to emphasize is as we've, um, over the last really decade or decade and a half, we've really started to appreciate um, ALS not only as what we call a sporadic disease, but an important subset of patients carry it in families. So you can see in the upper left-hand corner, about 90% of patients have what we call sporadic disease. That is, we don't understand where the disease specifically comes from, nor does it obviously run in families. But an important subset, maybe 10% of patients, carry it in families, and we can identify specific genes that are associated with those patients um, uh, who carry the disease. And if you look here on the right, if you look at a, uh, this pie chart of all patients or most patients with genetic forms of the disease, the majority of those patients carry a, an abnormality in this, in this gene called C9ORF72. Others, uh, others um, uh, have mutations in genes called SOD1, and then further um, other smaller percentages of those patients carry abnormalities in other, in other genes. And why is that important? That's important uh, thematically because I'm gonna revisit that later. For the first time now, we have very specific targets and we can target those specific genes for patients who carry those abnormalities and try to turn those genes off. And so in fact, about 7% of patients with sporadic ALS probably have these abnormalities of this C9 gene hiding out in their genome or in their families. So how do we make an ALS diagnosis? You know, remarkably, we still rely very much on the history, uh, that is what the patient has to say, the neurological examination, of course, an EMG studies where we look at the nerve conduction and how the nerve and the muscle are talking to each other. We rely on imaging studies, sometimes MRI scans, to look for other causes that may mimic ALS. We take blood to look for things like Lyme disease, thyroid dysfunction, B12 deficiency, other things that can potentially look like ALS. We look at patient breathing function as a supporting diagnosis. And more and more commonly now, we're also looking at genetic testing. And in fact, now I do genetic tests or I offer genetic testing on, for all my patients. So I think these are important components as we think about how to diagnose ALS. So when I visit the clinic, in addition to diagnosing ALS, there are some important questions that we as clinicians and as scientists are still uh, trying to understand. And one of those is, as a general rule, why does weakness in ALS seem to have a distinct anatomical spread? That is, a patient who presents with foot weakness is more likely to have continued weakness in the foot or in the leg, rather than suddenly jumping to, let's say, the uh, problems with speech. Why do some ALS patients have progress more slowly and others more rapidly? Why do some ALS patients have prominent upper motor neuron disease with stiffness and spasticity and slow movements, whereas others have abnormalities of lower motor neuron dysfunction, muscle atrophy, muscle fasciculations, those kinds of problems? Why do some patients have speech problems, swallowing problems, and others have foot drop or hand weakness? And why are certain cell populations in the brain spared? Patients don't tend to develop double vision or problems with their eye movements. And overall, they don't tend to have problems with autonomic function like their heart rate or their bladder or bowel dysfunction. Importantly, we no longer think of ALS just as a neuromuscular disease. 
but rather as a neurodegenerative disease. In fact, we know this because some patients, a subset, can actually get something called frontotemporal dementia or problems with memory. So while we think about this as being a problem with nerve and muscle, there are also sometimes memory problems in patients with ALS. Now I put this slide up, not because I'm gonna go through it in detail, but um, to show you the many pathways and the many targets that um, we're looking at with regard to ALS, the, uh, the causes of ALS. So this is a motor neuron here with lots of potential ALS relevant targets, but there are also cells called microglial cells of the brain that are involved in brain inflammation. Astrocytes, which are supporting cells of the brain that also clearly play a role in disease uh, progression after onset. So this is just a snapshot, if you will, of some of the ALS relevant targets that we and others are looking at to try to stop a disease. Well, what about ALS management? I'm not gonna talk about this in great detail, but I will say um, this, in addition to the initial drug therapies that we, um, that we uh, start patients on, we also are very keen, and you'll see, on enrolling in clinical trials. We uh, do know that it's important for multidisciplinary care, that is for patients to be seen not only by a physician, like me or my colleagues, but also by a nurse practitioner, a physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, pulmonologist, et cetera. So it's a whole team approach that has been shown to be clearly beneficial for patients with ALS. Cognitive therapy can be relevant for some patients. We believe that exercise in some forms can be helpful, physical and occupational therapy to both prevent falls, but to also maintain mobility and function. Nutritional support we know is really critical in overall management. And finally, respiratory support through a variety of different strategies can be relevant as well. So I'm not going to hone in specifically so much on some of these multidisciplinary details other than to say it's really a team management um, strategy that the ALS Association in particular supports that helps, um, I believe, our patients. So I'm going to touch first of all on um, the three um, drugs that we currently associate with, with ALS use, two being new drugs um, this uh, approved this year. So what are the therapeutic targets for ALS? Many of you uh, who um, perhaps are on this uh, webinar may be taking Riluzol, also known as Rilutec. And this drug has been around for about 25 years, and it works by reducing the amount of glutamate that this red shaded area um, it reduces the amount of glutamate released from one cell to another. And we think when glutamate is released in excess, it overstimulates nerves, makes them too excitable, and they subsequently um, uh, go on to die. So we know through some very good studies that by using Riluzol, we can reduce the amount of glutamate that's released from those cells and reduce nerve um, hyperexcitability and preserve nerve or motor neuron survival. You might say, well, it only pr prolongs survival by three months. And I would argue, while that's true for all comers, we like to start the, the drug early because that's when the most motor neurons are there to be really neuroprotected. And so it may be that some patients respond better than others to really solve. I like it because it's easy to take. It's taken twice a day. It seems to be well tolerated, although it does require some monitoring of liver enzymes. And it's relatively inexpensive when compared with some other therapies. So the second drug, which has really been around in an intravenous form called a Daravone or Radicava, was approved in 2017 for intravenous use and then just became available in May of this year for um, oral use. So how does it work? If we go to this one of these pictures of these nerve cells, it seems to, to act in the mitochondria, that is the, the power sources, the energy sources of the cells. And we believe that in ALS, something called reactive oxygen species build up. And when they build up, they um, result in a lot of havoc for the cell and for these mitochondria. And so Adaravone acts to really scavenge these free radicals or these reactive oxygen species to reduce those oxygen species and subsequently protect 
motor neurons. So studies suggested in a subpopulation of ALS patients that can slow disease progression as defined by this ALS functional rating scale over a six month period. Interestingly, it was first designed as a therapy for acute stroke in Japan. And that really accounts for why the drug is taken in these cycles. That is, it's administered orally, taken once daily for two weeks with a two week off period, and then administered um, once a day for 10 days, followed by this two week rest period. So these cycles of administration for this drug. I would say in general, I think it seems to be tolerated pretty well. The most common side effects are headache, bruising, and some gait problems. Unfortunately, it's still in the absence of insurance approval is quite expensive at over $170,000 per year. The IV formulation, as I pointed out, was, has been around for about four or five years, the oral form most recently being approved in May. Well, this is the new drug that was just really approved uh, on September 29th by the FDA. It goes by the name AMX0035, and it's a combination of two drugs, sodium phenylbutyrate and a drug called Tutka, which is a, with a very long name. So how does this drug work? Well, probably a couple of different ways. Much like a Darabone, it probably reduces these reactive oxygen species and also um, results in the, um, the reduction of a, a cell death phenomenon called apoptosis. So it, it works in these two ways, but probably more importantly act to reduce something called ER stress. When proteins are folded abnormally, they are processed through the endoplasmic reticulum, and this results in a stress response that is uh, ameliorated by this compound. It's also given by mouth at, at a cost of over $150,000 in the absence of insurance. Um, I will say there are some GI side effects, Patients oftentimes reported in the first three weeks having difficulty with some nausea, diarrhea, sometimes abdominal pain. So this is one of the caveats of taking this medication, but I think these are relatively early days with regard to the drug. Well, what are the data to suggest how this drug might work? It was an original publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, that you can see highlighted here on the left, where 137 people with ALS took um, either the drug which I'm going to call Relivrio or placebo. And this, um, the main outcome measure was this ALS functional rating scale over a six month period of time. And you can see that patients who took placebo tended to decline by 1.66 points per month, whereas those who took the drug declined by only 1.24%, which was found to be significant. And if you look here, at the way the ALS functional rating scale declines over time. Those in green had placebo and those in red were, took drug. So there was a benefit, albeit modest over that six month period. The second piece of data, however, that came out and I think was potentially more exciting was as we followed patients for a longer period of time in what we call the open label extension, those patients who received drug during the earliest phases and then continued on it, seemed to have a benefit of about six months improvement um, compared to those patients who didn't. In fact, some patients are still being followed who were taking drug. So I think it's this survival data that also potentially pushed the FDA to approve the drug. And it's important to know that this drug is still being studied in an ongoing trial. So despite these modest successes in ALS, we really have to do better. So what are the phases of clinical trials? There are typically three or four phases. Phase one is where the very earliest phase where researchers test a new drug candidate in healthy volunteers, or sometimes in patients with a disease of interest. The primary purpose of a phase one study is to evaluate safety. Researchers can answer or ask other questions in a phase one trial. How much drug is in the blood? Or maybe some of you have had a lumbar puncture to see how much drug is in the spinal fluid in and around the brain. And potentially different doses of medication can be studied as well. 
In a phase two study, it's, uh, drugs are usually given to a larger group of patients, maybe a few hundred, um, and they're usually given to patients with the disease. A key focus of phase two studies is to then look for the optimal dose of the drug. How much drug might be too much with too many side effects, but how much drug can be given to potentially maximize benefit while minimizing risk. And then finally for phase three studies, these are typically larger studies, 300 to maybe thousands of patients for which um, the medicine is to be used. They either get placebo, um, placebo or they get um, drug. So what we really wanna know in a phase three study is whether there's a treatment benefit. And these are oftentimes resulting in what we call pivotal studies. That is the critical study necessary for approval by the Food and Drug Administration or other regulatory um, entity. So um, a um, uh, new drug application is submitted to the FDA for consideration um, for marketing approval if phase three studies are found to be successful. And if phase three studies are found to be successful, that's when I as a clinician can subsequently write a prescription. There have been some, um, some um, uh, cases in ALS. Relivrio would be one example that was approved based on phase two data, but not phase three data. So I think there's good news for ALS patients with regard to clinical trials in ALS. And you can see this graph here where the number of clinical trials either sponsored by a company, an institution, or by the government have steadily increased over the last, let's say, 10 years. So phase one, two, and three clinical trials are um, in ALS are now recruiting participants. There are broad spectrum of ALS pathways being targeted. The emphasis is on now on relatively short, double-blind phases, maybe six months, followed by what we call open-label extensions where everyone gets drug. We're seeking more input with, from people with ALS regarding clinical trial design. We're stratifying patients by maybe their genetic background, disease severity or progression. So for example, what's good for one patient may not be good for the other patient. And we're trying to understand what that is and trying to um, use drugs that might be most appropriate for certain ALS patient populations. We're including now something called biomarkers, that is maybe blood or maybe imaging studies that can maybe help us understand more about how a drug is working, um, how quickly disease may be progressing or slowing. Um, so these are, this is a, a, a hot topic and I'll touch on it later. So let's, let me start with um, uh, one of these therapies. This is kind of a class of therapies. This is a class of therapies we call gene therapies. And the most common gene therapy is something called antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs. These are ASO mediated gene therapies. And how do they work? I told you earlier that maybe seven to 10% of patients might have specific genetic abnormalities that lead to ALS. So if we know the gene or the genetic problem that you can see here in red that produces a specific, what we call RNA, we can design a drug called an ASO that specifically targets that gene. And it targets that gene and only that gene and calls in a host of other cellular processes to break up that gene. So if you have, if that gene is producing too much of a bad protein, we can knock that protein out or knock that protein down. There's some other subtle biological pathways that are also relevant that these ASO therapies can target. And I'm not gonna go through that today. One of the challenges with these antisense oligonucleotides is they are big, drugs, if you will. And so typically they can't be given intravenously or by mouth. They have to be given by a lumbar puncture, that is to get right into the spinal fluid so they can get around the spine and around the brain where the, the genes of interest are targeting. So this has been a very active area of research and a very active area of clinical trials. So the first study using this antisense oligonucleotide strategy was called the Valor study. And it was an early phase 
one study from a drug called BIIB067. It's not so much important what the drug uh, number was, but it was targeting this gene called SOD1. And I told you about that earlier. So if we look at the cell, it targeted a misfolded SOD1 protein, but it also targets normal SOD1 protein. So the theory is if we reduce the amount of this abnormal protein, can we affect disease progression? And so only patients with SOD1 mutations in their family or in them um, were able to participate. So it was given intrathecally, that is into the spinal fluid, and the initial studies lasted 36 weeks. Well, interestingly, at first blush, it did not achieve a significant enough effect at, at six months duration, but there were some important um, uh, observations as part of this study. With longer term follow-up of these patients after six months, it did seem to show a slowing of decline in patients who were progressing faster, and in fact, maybe even a stabilization in patients who had slowly progressing disease. Importantly, for the field as a whole, it was able to, we were able to demonstrate that it was able, that drug was able to reduce the amount of SOD1 protein, showing that it worked like it was supposed to do it. And it also reduced something called plasma NFL or neurofilament light chain. This may be a biomarker of nerve cell loss. And so it was able to ameliorate that process. The adverse events were mild to moderate severity. Again, patients had to get these lumbar punctures um, sequentially, which was uh, challenging, but not impossible. So that's one particular gene therapy. There's another particular gene therapy going on now and open for enrollment to target another gene that may be a risk factor for ALS. <clears throat> it's a gene called ataxin-2. And when ataxin-2, this, this particular protein is present or abnormally uh, uh, biologically active, it seems to be an increase, increase the risk for ALS. So some very smart researchers showed in um, a mouse model of ALS that if they injected this or, or shut down this ataxin-2 gene, they were able to prolong survival in these ALS mice. So they were able to prolong survival in these ALS mice. In green, you see um, survival at 100% and over time how it changes compared to those mice that did not receive drug that died relatively quickly. So is this able to be translated? Absolutely. So this is currently um, of interest uh, to us and we are clinic currently doing a, um, a gene therapy study to try to knock down this protein. It, the study is six months duration. It's given into the spinal fluid, so it does require repeated what we call intrathecal injections, but I think a really interesting and novel pathway to target a very specific gene. And I'm not gonna belabor the point of gene therapy other than to tell you there are other genes that are being targeted as well, including another gene called FUS, F-U-S. What about other therapies? I showed you this picture of the, of the cell. We're currently, um, there's a, a current study enrolling from a company called Calico Life Sciences to look at this drug with this kind of long name. But what I wanna emphasize to you is what it's unique. It's unique from others and that it targets this particular pathway to help um, activate the, what we call the unfolded protein response or integrated stress response. I told you earlier that when proteins in ALS are misfolded or don't end up in the right conformation, they wreak havoc on the cell. This, um, and the cell has ways of dealing with that. This particular drug seems to augment that pathway to result, to result in more normal folding and redu reduction of what we call ER stress. It's an early phase study. We're looking mostly at safety and tolerability. It's given by mouth, but this study does require a couple of lumbar punctures or spinal fluid, spinal taps, if you will, because we wanna know if the drug gets into the brain and the spinal cord. It's a 48 week study, but only the first four weeks 
are patients given a placebo or drug. The rest of the time they get drug. <coughs> The next drug is a brand new target. Uh, the study is called COMBAT. The drug is called Ibutilast here in the middle. It also has a chemical name here, but Ibutilast is the common name. And it acts on a different mechanism. Instead of acting on neurons or motor neurons, it acts on these cells called microglia. This was a cell type I mentioned earlier. These are inf inflammatory cells <coughs> of the brain. I'm going to pause here. <coughs> and it seems that by quieting these cells down, we can actually reduce nerve inflammation, slow disease progression, <coughs> and potentially have a benefit. <coughs> it too is given by mouth. And this study is about a year in duration with an open label extension. So again, a unique target looking at brain inflammation. <clears throat> I wanna make a couple points about the Healy platform trial. Many of you have probably heard of this trial with about 50 or 70 sites here in the US. So the idea behind the trial is rather than test 10 therapies individually, for example, that would require 2,400 participants and 1,200 people to get placebo, and it might take a year to study, the platform top, the, or, I'm sorry, 12 years to study, the platform trial allows us to reduce the time for this kind of a study with <clears throat> fewer participants and fewer placebo uh, patients. So this allows us to run a study in parallel. And this is the way it works. Patients enroll in the platform study. And for example, they might get therapy A, therapy B, or therapy C. For every patient who gets therapy A, there's a three in four chance. So for every three patients that get drug, one patient will get placebo. And by running these studies in parallel, we can do what we call sharing the placebo. And that is, <clears throat> we can now have more patients getting drug and fewer patients getting placebo. And the placebo controlled study runs for about six months. And after that six month period, patients can either go into an open label extension where everyone gets drug, or they can re-enroll and get randomized to, for one of these therapies. <clears throat> So the idea here is more patients get drug, fewer patients get placebo. We can study more drugs or more therapies in a shorter period of time. So what are the results of the Healy trial regimen to date? The first drug from a company called Raw Pharmaceuticals was called Xyluclopan, and it was stopped early. And why was it stopped early? Because some smart statisticians we're able to say during the course of the study that there was no reason to continue this drug because there was not going to be a benefit down the road. So they stopped the study for what we call futility. This subsequently allowed patients to enroll in other clinical trials or take other medications without having to wait the full six month period of time. Regimen B, a drug called Verdipristat, did not meet its what we call primary or secondary endpoints. That is, it didn't meet its primary endpoint of the ALS functional rating scale, nor some of the secondary endpoints of strength and other measures. So subsequently, this drug is not being prescribed for ALS patients. Regimen C was sponsored um, in part from a company called Clean Nanomedicine, and the drug has a name and a number. While it didn't seem to slow progression of the disease by the ALS functional rating scale, in a small number of patients, a very small number of patients, um, there was a, a reduction in the risk of death for those taking the 30 milligram per day dose of the medication. So I think the, the, for regimen C for this particular drug, more study is needed, probably with a larger patient population <clears throat> 
And um, I would say stay tuned on this uh, particular drug therapy. Regimen D, a drug called Prodopidine, is still ongoing. Um, patient, most patients are in the open label extension, and we should know the results of those studies uh, of this particular uh, drug soon. Regimen E is a drug called Trehalose from a company called Celos Therapeutics. It's now recruiting as part of the Healy trial. I want to make the point that every one of these drugs, A, B, C, D, and E, are all targeting different um, ALS relevant pathways. <clears throat> So what about other new studies? This is a, um, a study with the name Himalaya. It's sponsored by a company called Sanofi. Again, another pathway. And I, I don't pretend to understand this entire diagram, but it targets this specific enzyme called RIPK1. And what does it do? It seems to quiet down the neuroinflammatory response in cell types like these astrocytes and microglia, the supporting cells or inflammatory cells of the brain. And we know those cells seem to influence motor neuron cell death. So can we quiet those cells down using this strategy? It's an oral medication with a six month double blinded phase followed by what we call an open label extension. So another drug study, that is um, enrolling currently or coming down the pipe, depending on the individual site. Well, what about a very different target? The COURAGE ALS study is a very different drug. And why is it different? The drugs I've told you about thus far target cells of the brain or the spinal cord. This one is different in that it targets the muscle. And this particular drug called RELDECEMPTIVE acts by improving the contractility of muscle. So can we get a bigger bang or more contractility of muscle, particularly the muscles of the diaphragm, by administering this drug? This is a pivotal study, a <clears throat> phase three study, the last phase of a study. Um, and it's an oral medication, six months on drug, and then six months with an open label extension. <clears throat> So we will know the results of this study um, in the coming months. I want to highlight, I just I was picking and choosing some of those drug candidates. I'll show you a more exhaustive list in a minute. But critical to our overall design of, of ALS therapeutics is to understand more about biomarkers. A biomarker can be diagnostic. That is, it may tell us about the presence of a disease. Maybe <clears throat> it may be a genetic biomarker. So if someone carries a gene, we know that they're at increased risk. We'll use an example like breast cancer, the BRCA1 gene may be an increased risk for breast cancer. Or for men, it might be a P <clears throat> PSA <clears throat> test that puts them at increased risk for prostate cancer. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are other biomarkers, prognostic biomarkers, predictive biomarkers, or pharmacodynamic markers that may tell us more about how disease changes over time. <clears throat> so along those lines, here at Hopkins, we're planning on a new study to look at brain imaging, to use brain imaging of inflammation of the brain that I was telling you about earlier. Can this be a biomarker of ALS, its activity, and could we use this particular method of imaging the brain to tell us something about inflammation and potentially tell us about how well drugs acting on inflammation might work. Because this is being recorded, I'm not gonna go through each of these um, in detail, other than to tell you these are, these are um, concepts in which we're interested. This is a little bit more of an exhaustive list, <clears throat> on the left in green are both clinical trials and research studies um, uh, currently uh, underway, uh, at least here at Hopkins, many of them also at other sites around the Mid-Atlantic region or around the country. In light green here at Hopkins are those that are um, 
upcoming. And here in red is just an example of some of the completed studies that we've performed here at Hopkins over the last two or three years, both from the standpoint of clinical trials or research studies. So hopefully this slide at least gives you a sense for the active um, number of clinical trials in the ALS community. So in summary for this part, ALS is a neurodegenerative disease that primarily affects motor neurons, but is being increasingly recognized as a multi-system disease. The diagnosis requires history and physical examination combined with other things to exclude causes of weakness. The number of genes associated with ALS uh, as either causative or risk factors is growing. It's a neurodegenerative disease with clinical and genetic heterogeneity, that is, different patients look different. <clears throat> it's likely that there are multiple cellular targets, and hopefully you've been able to appreciate that. Multiple cellular targets, both within motor neurons, as well as other types like astrocytes or microglia that affect how ALS starts and progresses. It requires a multidisciplinary approach, and there are numerous clinical trials for different cellular targets being conducted both nationally as well as internationally. So where are we going uh, in the future? I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of things on which we would like to improve. The first is use developing new models in the laboratory to understand ALS. Can we predict in a more efficient way what drugs might be best for patients? <clears throat> We've leaned heavily on this mouse called the SOD1 mouse, but we're now using worm models of ALS, fruit fly models of ALS, zebra fish models of ALS, even yeast models of ALS, and finally, <clears throat> induced pluripotent stem cells. And again, these are all being used in laboratories like mine and others really around the country and around the world to try to say, can we get better therapeutics to patients and can we have better predictions of those drugs that might work? We've heavily invested in induced pluripotent stem cells. These are cells that can be made from ALS patients. <clears throat> we can take blood from patients, from patients with sporadic ALS here in orange, familial ALS in green, <coughs> or even healthy controls. We can turn them into IPS cells and make them into neurons, astrocytes, all kinds of cell types of the brain and spinal cord. And we can then use them in a dish to understand ALS specific pathology, we can record from them to understand their electrophysiology. We can um, administer uh, stress the cells. We can look at different cell type contributions. And finally, we can do drug screening for potential ALS therapy, therapy candidates. <clears throat> I mentioned biomarkers. We typically think of blood biomarkers or spinal fluid biomarkers. But there are others, brain and spinal cord tissue biomarkers. We're looking at biomarkers in the urine, skin biomarkers by taking a skin sample, muscle biomarkers, electrophysiology, that is like an EMG nerve conduction study. Can that predict disease? And finally, as an example I pointed to earlier, can we use brain imaging as a biomarker for neuroinflammation or nerve degeneration? <clears throat> I want to show you this. This is the number of genes that have been discovered as causative agents for ALS. The number of genes is here on the y-axis and the years of, on the x-axis. You can just see this enormous growth in the number of genes related to ALS. Why is that important? Each of those gene discoveries gives us potential new targets and an understanding for potential pathways related to the disease. And finally, I'm showing you this picture of a motor neuron here, an astrocyte and a microglial cell here, and even muscle here. And every one of these blue circles that I'm showing you is a current drug being studied in ALS that targets those specific pathways. So lots of pathways, lots of drugs um, out there and, and coming down the pipeline. <clears throat> so I will stop there. I'm happy to 
my voice holds out to answer as many questions as I can, and I appreciate your time. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Marigakis. I really appreciate this is very informative and uh, much appreciated. So let's see. Okay. Okay, the first question is, are researchers finding more gene abnormalities in ALS? Is it worth repeating gene tests for sporadic patients? Great question. So um, currently, um, commercially, <clears throat> we can look at about 40 different genes. The tests are currently free. They re only require a mouth swab, really they don't even require blood. <clears throat> Those expanded gene tests have been around for, I wanna say about a year, maybe two years. So if an individual or a family was, was examined five years ago, 10 years ago, we certainly have discovered more genes. So I think the answer to that is yes, unless you've had gene testing in the last, let's, let's say the last year. Thank you. So we have another one. What are the exclusion criteria for these new drug, new study drugs? Is it safe to assume that those with ALS diagnosis greater than five years would be excluded? So thanks for your question. Um, the uh, potentially for some of you who have either been part of a trial or have tried to get into a trial, you, you probably know that every inclusion and exclusion is a little bit different depending on the drug being studied or the pathway being studied. I, I would say specific to your question, the answer is um, generally for patients who've had disease for a very long period of time, let's say over, over five years, um, I am not currently aware of any specific studies that allow or that are that are um, investigating patients who've had such slowly or long progressing disease. I think that's right. Okay. So anyway, Richard I, just I, I'm sorry. And that, well, I would just okay if, if you have a specific question about a clinical trial, my advice is to contact your local ALS clinic or um, um, uh, clinical trials unit, whoever whatever that might be, to ask about <clears throat> The specific trials that they're doing because like again those are they look very different depending on the study so right. richard just wanted to thank you i don't know if you can see these questions dr marigakis but he wanted to thank you and he said that uh, excellent i wish you were a doctor for my mother when she was diagnosed in 1972. so any other questions that anybody has Here we go. Are there any studies working on, I don't, I'm not sure. It looks like the question wasn't finished. Tommy, if you can retype that or. Let's see if he can re retype that. I don't, um, didn't fill the whole whole question up so yeah unfortunately i can't i can't see the questions either okay so That's i'm going to go up oh, here we go here's the second part are there any studies working on inserting or replacing tdp43 into the nucleus oh great question um so there is <clears throat> there are um, dozens, now maybe hundreds of laboratories um, trying to understand just that, just that point. How do we keep TDP43 in the nucleus where it belongs <clears throat> and not out in the cytoplasm where it's what we call mislocalized? So the, the answer to your question is that there are no um, active studies, at least as I'm thinking about it, that, that specifically do that but there are lots of both drugs that are, are purported to do that and lots of laboratories that are interested in that exact question. 
So Ben wanted to know if he could get a copy of the slides. I don't know if you share your slide deck. Well, I think it'll be, it, it will be recorded. So I think that yes, could be most helpful. Yeah. So do you have, um, Frank wanted to know if you had a personal opinion of Ibutilast. <clears throat> so for Ibutilast, I would say it's been around for some time. It's had, and there's some very, um, interesting data in ALS patients prior to the current study. Um, mechanistically, I think it's really interesting um, because it targets microglia and neuroinflammation. So for those reasons, I think um, Ibutilas is a very interesting target, absolutely. I also would tell patients, just as a side note to Ibutilas specifically, patients often say, do I prefer one drug over another? And what I would tell patients is this, <clears throat> I wouldn't do a study here at Hopkins that I didn't think was scientifically sound. Um, and so I wanna be clear in that respect. And the other quite honest answer is for most of these drugs, you know, we don't know if one is, let's say, better than another. So I, I try to guide my patients and give them the most information and honest opinions, but um, safety is number one. And I think, um, uh, a good scientific rationale is number two. So I think that would be my take on Ibutilast. Okay. The Cutters wanted to say thank you, Dr. Maragakis, and that they miss you. So they've seen you in clinic before. Absolutely. Amy and Mike. <laughs> yeah. So um, any research going beyond therapeutics looking to reverse ALS symptoms? Well, I would say this. Um, I would love to hit that home run. Mm -hmm. We know when we do muscle biopsies, let's say we don't typically do muscle biopsies of patients, but if we were to do a muscle biopsy of patient, we know that nerves, as long as the motor neuron is intact, it can regenerate. It can go back to muscle. Best example would be polio. We know that even patients with polio where motor neurons die, the ones that are still there can regrow into muscle. So if we were able to stop, let's say, the disease, in theory, those nerves could those those nerves that are still there, those motor neurons that are still there, could regenerate. So I think the answer to your question is we would love to hit a home run like that, but it's not like the current drugs are only trying to do something halfway. Every one of these drugs hopes for a um, not only to to slow disease, but to stop disease with the idea of, of, of regenerating. But gosh, we just have not done a good enough job to see, to stop the disease to the point where we feel comfortable about saying, let's get patients, can we get patients better? We've got a, a ways to go um, to get there. Okay. <clears throat> Has there been any analysis whether COVID is causing ALS in individuals? Well, I think, um, uh, you know, it, it, <clears throat> you, one could argue it's still early days because, you know, the, the COVID um, pandemic is, some would argue, still going on. But so I would say there's nothing obvious to me that either COVID or the vaccine is an instigator of disease. Could five years from now, 10 years from now, something like that, you know, change our thinking, it's, it's certainly possible. I would leave that open to possibility. It's not a, what we call a neurotropic virus like polio, for example, um, that clearly is, or West Nile virus that clearly is. So it acts a little bit differently. So, you know, my anecdotally for the patients I've seen, I can't say I've seen a sudden spike in those patients who've either acquired COVID or been vaccinated. Any studies being okay. done on high good cholesterol? Well, there have been some studies with cholesterol in general. Um, and um, I would say the data are okay. Um, but I don't know about specifically, I think you're referring to HDL. Um, I can't speak specifically to that. I just don't know the answer. It's certainly possible someone's looking at that. Um, but I, not to my knowledge. 
There's a question, does exercise help with ALS? Well, it's, 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 it's a great question. So much so that we uh, published a study <coughs> back in 2019, 2017, 2019, with that question in mind. When I went back and looked, the, the conventional wisdom was don't exercise because it'll make the disease go faster. And so we want to know whether that was the case. So we looked at patients, three groups of patients, one group that did stretching and range of motion, one that did endurance exercise in the form of a stationary bicycle, and one group that did resistance exercise. We saw no worsening of disease. There was a suggestion in patients who did resistance exercise and endurance exercise that they may have had fewer falls. So I'm a, I'm a believer that stretching and range of motion should be absolutely done that in moderation, we suggest three days a week of some form of exercise could be um, it's certainly not harmful and could be beneficial as well. How many trials can an ALS patient partake in at one time? Typically only one. Okay. For someone thinking of participating in a trial, what criteria should they consider in selecting a trial? Uh, very individualized, obviously, but I would say <clears throat> just off the top of my head, things to think about would be how close you are to a center, in other words, and how frequently um, uh, how frequently you would have to return to a center. So for example, if you live six hours away from Johns Hopkins um, and you were required to come every week, that might be tough. Um, so that's one thing to think about, distance from the center. Um, the type of intervention, is it an oral medication, an IV medication, is it uh, intrathecal, given by spinal tap would be another consideration. <clears throat> In general, I will tell you that studies are most um, uh, time consuming at the beginning, maybe the first month or two, and then the, the visits tend to spread out. Um, what are the side effects of a medication, right? What are the known side effects? How well tolerated it can be? Um, those are some of the things that I would think of off the top of my head as far as choosing a, a potential study. We're going to do a couple more. I have a feeling, Dr. Marigakis, we could keep you here all day answering questions, asking questions. Any trials for TARDBP gene defect? So that's a great question. So for TDP43, um, we do know that a small percentage of patients carry mutations in that gene. <clears throat> right now, there are no specific targeted therapies for that particular um, gene. It, it's TDP43 probably, um, it's a, um, it's a uh, slippery character. Slippery character, I guess, for lack of a better term. There's a lot we still don't understand about that protein and, and why it ends up where it does. So the short answer is not specifically targeting that gene or patients with uh, those gene mutations. Any promising stem cell therapies that might become available in the next six months to year? Um, I think the... Um, so here, at least here at Hopkins, I think the answer is um, not currently. Um, could there be some um, stem cell therapies um, given intrathecally? I, I think that's um, it's possible. Um, I don't mean to be coy about it. I just um, I think a lot of groups are interested, but I don't know other than the brainstorm therapeutics um, trial, which uh, finished over the last year. Um, I don't know a lot of groups that are actively investigating stem cell therapeutics. Okay. How do you find out your own specific TDP43 level or if you have a loss? There are no real assays right now to, to understand that. It, this happens at the cellular level. So um, um, we don't think it's so much about how much, how much TDP43 or how little you have, but where it is in the cell. So currently, there are no really direct ways of, of looking at that. There are a lot of people interested in this as a biomarker 
and trying to understand um, its downstream effects uh, in the blood uh, or in the spinal fluid. So it's not something that we can write a prescription to order a TDP 43 level. What is the difference between Radicava and Relivrio? <clears throat> well, they work a little bit differently. Um, and they're two very different drugs. One is a Relivrio is a combination of two drugs acting a couple of different ways. Uh, Adaravone or Radicava is one drug acting probably in one specific mechanism. So different drugs, probably different side effects. Um, I think I, I didn't point this, I didn't say this because we didn't talk about so much about just normal disease management, but given my druthers, I'd love to see my patients on all three drugs, Riliazole, Radicava, and Relivrio. And I think in the next three months, four months, we're going to start to see patients on all three drugs. How much of a, how much bang for our buck will we get? I think it's exciting. I just think we don't know. So I'm excited to see, I'm very hopeful that we'll see um, with those three drugs in combination, we'll see some exciting results. We just don't know. We've never looked at all three drugs together. Got two more, and then we're going to let you let you uh, rest a little bit. Right. Is there a way to find out the percentage of motor neuron death a person has at any point in time? Is there a way? Is there a measurement for it? There's not a direct measurement for it. Um, some studies have suggested that <clears throat> by the time a patient has weakness. They've lost maybe 50, 50, 50, 0% of the cells in that area. So of the nerves going to the hand, let's say, by the time you have hand weakness, you've lost half the motor neurons going to the hand. That's kind of speculation. There's no way of really quantifying that more specifically. Um, there is something called a neurofilament level. I alluded to that. Um, it tends to be higher in... Um, in certain populations of patients than in others. Um, and there's still a lot of work going on with neurofilament, but it doesn't give you a direct one-to-one -one correlation. So for our last question, are there FTD drugs and or treatments that can be used that will not interfere with a clinical trial for endeavorone? Also, strange that the ALSFRS just focuses on physical status markers and very little attention of assessing FTD. It's a very good point. Um, so there's probably some overlap between patients with FTD, patients with ALS, and obviously some have both. Your point is well taken. There are some measures of cognitive function for FTD. And in some studies, um, we're using two different, uh, two different scales. So um, you're right, the ALS-FRS doesn't incorporate any kind of cognitive measure. Um, I, <clears throat> I don't think that there are any specific drugs that target FTD that can be, let's say, written as a prescription um, that would or would not interfere with the Darabone. There's probably some crossover um, for drugs that might work for ALS, might also work for FTD, um, but no drugs that I'm aware of that are on the market for FTD that might also help with ALS. And the last question actually is going to go towards you, Reagan. Um, how do we give the folks the site for when this goes um, recording to the um, our YouTube channel? Um, I can send it out to the care services team who can then go ahead and send it out to their caseload or their, whoever attends support group or... Um, I don't have a list of all the attendees from today, but we will definitely get it out to you, Ben, and then whoever else, you know, is okay. looking for it as well. And maybe thank we'll you. even post it on our social media. Okay, thank you. Dr. Marigakis, I looked at all what you were doing, and one of the first things I thought of was, oh my goodness, how did you find the time out of your day to be able to do this for us? And I just want to thank you so much. It was really um it, it was just great. And several people, I didn't say them all, but several people wanted to thank you so much. So
thank you for doing this for us and for your time and for everything that you do for all of our patients. Well, thank you. It's a it's a pleasure to and, and a pleasure to um, try to help our patients, and um, I'm I'm happy to do it. And hopefully, I can come back in the future and tell you more. We would love that. We would definitely love that. All right. 